Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 13 of the Applied MMT podcast. Uh, we are going to kick it off today just kind of going through what's going on in the market and what our take on that is. Uh, so first of all, Ryan, I think, I mean, you and I have been making this observation for a long time now that there's, despite all this talk of recession for months and months and months now, um, we're, we're yet to see any signs of a recession and the market and the, you know, the unemployment rate, the real economy are actually both in really good shape. So unemployment is at a multi-decade low and looking at, uh, you know, equities. Over half a century. Over half a century low. <laughs> <laughs> and looking at equities in particular, and then also Bitcoin, which is supposedly a zero interest rate phenomenon. Um, <laughs> so at the end of last year, we saw like the most aggressive rate hikes. Um, I think, you know, definitely since Volcker, right? Yeah. And S and P 500 is up about 10% year to date. NAS- <laughs> NASDAQ is up 22% year to date. We actually just had the highest close um, since August of 22, uh, the NASDAQ that is. Bitcoin is up 62% year to date, which you often hear people refer to as a zero interest rate phenomenon. And the iShares home construction ETF um, is up 28.45% year to date as of today, um, May 19th. So, and, and what's interesting to me is, you know, everyone is focused on this potential recession still, and no one is really looking at the broader picture and seeing that <clears throat> the employment market is really tight and the stock market um, in aggregate is performing extremely well, uh, ev- even though we had these, these rate hikes that supposedly, uh, you know, are contractionary. Yeah, I mean, it's just you know what's what's remarkable about those statistics too, Adam, is that like literally I I heard for over a decade about how all these uh, you know speculative tech stocks, a lot of which make up the Nasdaq, are overvalued because of because of zero interest rates, and it's only because of zero interest rates, and and literally we've had like the again like you said this most aggressive rate hike since Volcker and it's the NASDAQ, right? The, the supposed, you know, long duration assets with cash flows out way into the future and stuff that are, that only benefited because of ZERP. They're the ones that have been, uh, you know, the uh, out, outperforming, uh, you know, the S and P 500 and, and it's, and, you know, the home builders, right? Like they, I mean, think about the, what everyone says about you know no, it, 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 the uh, rate hikes are going to crush the housing market. No one, you know, that no one's going to be able to to afford the new homes and stuff. And look, the home builders are making fifty two week highs like every like every day. <laughs> highs, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable how incredibly wrong everyone has. Uh, it, like like is about this about this whole rates thing right and 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 what, what do we see today 93 percent of s p 500 earnings have come in better than expected right and, and earnings growth is up i think like nine percent year on year i mean I, I, I mean it's who could have seen that coming <laughs> who could have seen it coming and it's it's <laughs> it's just it's just it's crazy to me that people uh you know the, the 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 consensus is still just mystified by this because it goes against you know conventional thinking when it comes to monetary policy. Right. It's just like oh the, you know th- these rate hikes were supposed to be contractionary. Turns out they're not. How could anyone <laughs> how could anyone possibly explain this when the explanation is like you know this stuff isn't complicated. It's really not. And I'm, I'm saying that about MMT in particular. Like it's not complicated if you look at the fiscal flows and you look at, you know, the, the like interest income channel, for example, I feel like most people would understand this, but for some reason, it's just entirely ignored still. And we're just living in this world where everyone's going, Oh, how could anyone have ever predicted this? This is crazy. A recession must be coming eventually. And we have no way of explaining what's going on with the economy right now. (laughs) And no, and not one of them will get fired either. Oh no, no. They'll they'll still be brought on to explain what's going on in the economy in right. five years and, and explain why you know r- rate hikes are are tightening <laughs> financial conditions or, or some nonsense like that. And and we should also. I just want to touch on. I know I know uh, we tweeted about this as well, but 
isn't it just insane that you know inflation is now coming down uh, substantially, and I think a lot of that is um, obviously the supply chain constraints and oil prices are falling. And like a year ago, you had all these big time economists saying that we needed 10% unemployment in order to uh, bring inflation down. I mean, this, these people are profound, are, 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 they're, they're a, they, they should be considered like national security threats. Like, I, <laughs> like, I, I, like, honestly, it's, they are so profoundly anti-American and, and intellectually dishonest. Like they, they should just be just, just discarded to the dustbin of history. Like, like it's so bad. It's so bad. It's so bad. And no, not one of them, not one of them apologizes either. Right. Like, that, I, I think, I don't know if we ever put this out, like, publicly, like, in, in written word or anything. But you and I were talking about, I was like, I think my, I think one of the few things that I would bet on this year is the deficit going higher and inflation going lower. Right. <laughs> right. Um. And that's literally ex- exactly what's happened so far. So, I, I mean, let's just let's just run with that for a second. When everyone people people want to blame inflation on on uh, you know this excessive government spending or something, literally the the fiscal year twenty twenty two budget deficit was less than it was in fiscal year twenty twenty one. And it was 2022 where we saw the big inflation spike. And then this year, 2023, has a higher deficit so far uh, than, than 2022. And we've seen inflation come down. So, right. so it's just it, – it, it, people – but you, you, you point this out to people and they're, they're just like – they refuse to – you know um, – it's like they refuse to to trust their their, their eyes. Like, right? It's like right. you're gonna believe me or your lying eyes, <laughs> right? Um, I, I, I'm really. I mean, I'm still kind of thinking about the discussion we had with Moser, and there's so much. I mean, I've listened to it like a number a number of times. I'm sure you have too. Yeah. And one thing that I keep coming back to is is his uh, comments on Argentina and how he's just like, yeah, you know, the the people who have all the money, they you know the, the you know the they raise the policy rate and. They give them more pesos. They just sell the pesos into the FX market. Right. <laughs> and, right. And, and I'm just thinking to myself, uh, or I was talking to a, uh, a, you know, a buddy the other day, and I was just like, yeah, that like, does that not make sense? Like, they're literally printing more pesos, and then they're just selling them into the FX market, and, and you know, their real purchasing power is going down. And people are always saying they have the same reaction. They're like, yeah, that makes sense. But, like, uh, yeah, you know, that's too out there. Right. <laughs> what do you mean it's too out there? That's, right. That's how these markets work. I mean, it's just, it, it's like, it is amazing that Argentina is continuing with the rate hikes. I know. It's, it's what I think, I think. It's 600 basis points. It went from 91 to 97% and inflation is <laughs> now over 100%. Yeah, I think, I think inflation, I think is, is, is 104% year over year. And they just raised rates to 97%. Like, <laughs> When when do they think you know when is it supposed to kick in when 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 is this supposed to start working? The rules warrants lie. Do you keep drilling holes in the boat. Uh, yeah, yeah. It goes out. Keep keep drilling holes in the boat until you let the water out. I mean, it's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Oh unbelievable. That was um, amazing. That was amazing. So a couple, yeah, and 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 you know, just thinking about like headlines that come out, you know, talking about earnings and stuff. Well, first of all. Um, and maybe we'll do a longer episode on on this. But I, I went to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting recently, and one one thing I just want to note really quick is is uh, Warren Buffett talking about how you know they had this sort of uh, warlike economy during COVID, right? Yep. And the government you know spent a lot of money, and that created this boom. And um, you know now they're and and you know they, they had massive backlogs and record sales and no one was discounting anything. And he, and he acknowledged that, you know, now they're kind of seeing some softness um, uh, or it, w- within the last six months, they've seen some softness, you know, a little bit more discounting promo- uh, you know, promotions and stuff. Um, it, it, that comes on the, you know, the heels of the, that record fis- fiscal tightening that we had in 2022. Right. I, I would just like to, to add in there, but again, just sorry to interrupt you, but again, something that's just never mentioned. Right. Like how do, how do we how do we explain that you know that technical recession we got in the beginning of 2022? Oh, no one knows. No one knows. 
<laughs> but what's funny is like people were outraged. Yeah. They, they claimed that, you know, the administration or, or, or people in the government were like moving the goalposts or changing the definition of of employment uh, uh, of of uh, of a recession but the reality was we had robust job gains and 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 declining unemployment so they couldn't you can't call that a recession according to you know the whatever the committee is that that uh you know d- decides whether we're in recession or not like you, l- 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 that's just in- in- incompatible um with you know their their standards for what uh you know defines a recession right um uh, you know, uh, it was Brian Moynihan, CEO of Bank of America, was going around saying, you know, we had a jobless recovery post global financial crisis. You know, this time around, we might have an unemployment less re- re- recession, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is right. basically what last year was. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, but just just to finish the one uh, the one comment on you know what uh, Buffalo was talking about is he said you know a little bit slower, a little more more discounting prom- promotion on on sales and. And so, um, you know, that'll be a hit to our earnings and stuff for this year. But he's like, no guarantees. But I'm have a pretty high degree of confidence that our earnings are, are you know, our operating earnings, as he defines it, are going to be up um, uh, in 2023 because of the interest that they're getting paid on, on their pile of cash. I mean, his, his whole thing now is, is he loves to talk about, uh, you know, how they, you know, he's got like his trader that comes in once a week or something and just rolls like 120 billion worth of T-bills. <laughs> right. And so, and so I said, yeah, you know, we'll just keep rolling some T-bills. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it seems like, it like, seems like Buffett is, is pretty close to just being an MM tier. Like it seems like we can kind of so we can just kind of count him in. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what it would take to officially count him in, but it seems it seems like he's pretty much on MMT's page. Oh, he's he's so close. And and Stephanie Kelted had him uh, or included quote uh, quotes from him quoted him in in the deficit myth. Um, you know because of his com and and she and she has been tweeting about this too how he's talked about how yeah no the United, the United States cannot voluntarily default you know it's not a we're not like Greece right so this was happening back in 2011 with the with the eurozone crisis he said we're not like Greece um, you know we are all of our debt is is in our own currency we can just print the money and and and, and you know pay back the debt uh, we can't involuntarily default on the debt and so he's he's said things like like that before I'll never forget personally just just a quick just a quick story yeah um, this was a year ago uh, uh, my firm goes to the, the Berkshire uh, meeting every year and so I was at the meeting a year ago and I had just signed up for the week-long MMT seminar at at the Levy Institute and you know I was a little bit I was a little bit nervous right because a I was paying for it you know out of my own pocket it wasn't like my firm was paying for it and it was just my own savings. And, you know, I was taking a week off of work and I, you know, I, we, we had a, uh, like a, like a five month old baby at that point. And so I was going to be, I mean, I was able to do some back and forth because it's about an hour and a half away from my home. Um, so I was able to make it work with my wife, but it was just like, it was kind of a big thing for me to do was, you know, spending my own money, you know, sacrificing time away from my family with my five, my five month old daughter and wife. And I'll never forget Buffett. This was last year, 2022. Uh, you know, he had been criticized by, I think it was Peter Thiel, uh, went on some, was down at like the Bitcoin conference or something like a week before the meeting and called Buffett like a, like a sociopathic, uh, geriatric grandpa or something and and said that you know we need we need like a political revolution to make uh, bitcoin money and all this other stuff and um buffett just you know on the uh uh the projector holds up 20 dollar bill and he basically says this is money this is the only thing that's going to be money you know for for your entire lives um and he said and the reason it's money is because it's the only thing that the IRS will will accept from you as payment for, uh, as your taxes. Right. And right. I'm just sitting there, and it, this that comment, no one. It's not like any like it just went over everyone's head. Right. Right. There was no like buzz about that comment or anything else. And I'm, and I'm thinking to myself like, 
what? <laughs> this, is, this is the thing about that. This is this is MMT. Yeah. Right? It's, yeah. It's the it's the government that that um you know uh, needs to resource itself, and so it imposes a tax, and then uh, you know it pays for 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 whatever the resources it needs in its own unit of account and, and, and then charges a tax in that unit of account. So it's like, this is literally him basically saying MMT is true and correct. Right. And this, and this guy is, you know, the, the, he's been the face of American capitalism for God knows how long, 50 years. And, 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 you know, he's like the most successful banking and insurance investor of all time, let alone investor. Um, And, and, you know, so, so I felt, a sense of relief. I was like, okay, no, I'm definite. I haven't gone crazy. (laughs) (laughs) I'm, you know, like this is, this is a prudent thing for me to go to and learn more about this conference and stuff. It's worth the money and the time away and stuff, because here's, here's Warren Buffett literally confirming, uh, you know, MMT's assertions as being, uh, correct. Right. Right. um, That was, so it's just kind of a, a, a fun, kind of personal uh story with that it's, it's it, you know it's not it's not a reason to to say um oh this is definitely right but but you know th- 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 this is it's good to have that kind of uh confirmation of approval yeah 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 <laughs> definitely if if warren buffett's on your side you're, you're probably uh making a good bet yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah and then, so, so speaking of so yeah so he's just like yeah you know we'll just roll some t-bills and and so um you know we'll we'll, we'll make that that's going to offset you know the some of the other weakness that we're saying seeing in in, in our companies and, and and that income is going to so our he's like our earnings are going to be up this is exactly what we've been talking about and i have okay so i have a you know cut out from a, a financial times article i think from last week or maybe or maybe two weeks ago uh, and because I'm I'm a boomer at heart, I, I cut this out of the paper. Um, so the headline is: U.S. U.S. banks defy turmoil with record eighty billion dollar earnings haul. <laughs> Profits advanced thirty three percent in first quarter. Um, uh, you know, and then below in the article, uh, okay, so it says uh, most of the industry is not failing. The economy is still in pretty good shape, hence those profits. Um, it says U.S. banks in general, benefited from rising interest rates, low loan defaults, and an expanding job market. <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> I think it was episode four where, where we talked about uh, banking and stuff and how, like, it's like, okay, like, okay, the, how do, do the interest, uh, the, the, how do the, the, the interest paid uh, through the income channel uh, actually you know, boost the economy. Yeah. Um, and, and essentially the argument was that this is, well, you know, you're, you're handing out money to, to, uh, you know, uh, you know, the holders of, of these, of these treasury securities. Uh, so, you know, companies like Berkshire Hathaway, so their earnings are going to be up. Right. Um, uh, so in, in general, when um, earnings are up, it, it means that companies can, uh, uh, invest more. They invest more in in capex, and so uh, that produces more productivity, more hiring, etc. Uh, the other thing is, um, uh, you know, for banks and stuff, banks hold a lot of these treasury securities, so that income, um, uh, you know, flows through, uh, you know, the income statement and and accrues. And helps build the, uh, you know, the capital ac- account, the equity capital. You know, assuming that, uh, uh, you know, that they can, that they're still making a positive net interest margin uh, spread between their assets and their liabilities. So that helps, sort of, you know, that helps grow bank earnings and 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 you know, uh, brings their cap capital ratios higher yeah so if let's say you're a, you know if you're a manager of the bank and you say like hey you know we're targeting like a you know 10 to 12 percent uh you know capital ratio or something and you're at 15 it's like well you know she's like this is too this is we, we need to go make more loans because we, right we need to bring that uh that that capital ratio down you know we're we're we're, we're our you know we're way above our target so we need to grow 
the asset size. We need to grow our balance sheet. We need to grow our assets, make more loans, um, because in doing so, um, that actually brings the 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 the, the uh, capital ratio lower, mm-hmm. right? It's, and then and then if you if you pull back, um, you know, and, and shrink the balance sheet, then the capital ratio is going to going to go higher, right? Um, uh, uh, assuming that you don't take any uh, impairments on on the assets that you sell, um, so but so th- again, like that's that's how this capitalist system works, and so that's why you know when you have this uh, fiscal spending impulse, whether it's uh, through um, social security, whether it's it's through uh, you know, I mean, there's obviously going to be variations in terms of um, economic outcomes. Um, you know, depending on what the actual spending, where, where the dollars actually flow to in, in, in the economy and stuff. But I think, I mean, uh, what I've been tracking is, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the deficit, the budget deficit year date has been around um, 7% of GDP. Yeah. And so for context, uh, you know, between 2013, 2019, it averaged around three and a half percent of GDP. So that's another reason why um, I, uh, you know, have come to agree with Moser is that at, at this level, at this magnitude of fiscal uh, spending relative to like, uh, it's going to count, it's going to counter, you know, the, 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 you know, these, these regional banks uh, failing and stuff because it's so much like is, are, are, are a couple of regional banks failing, really gonna do enough to offset you know seven percent uh, uh you know government spending in, in, of gdp into the economy right again we didn't have a recession in 2013 to 2019 and it was at three and a half percent yeah so even if you say okay higher rates and banks blowing up um would would shave off three three points off of, off the uh, of uh you know the uh you know would would counter three points worth of three percent of GDP, which would be, I think, crazy and ridiculous to assume that. But even if you assume that that's correct, you're still at a net four percent um, fiscal spending impulse. Uh, you know, if you if you take government spending and, and you know ba- and backing out this kind of banks blowing up and 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 credit pullback, so you're still at four percent. Right. Well, it, it was at three and a half percent twenty thirteen and twenty nineteen. So. I, like I, I don't really see, I don't really see the issue, and and it and it is it's it's true by the way that like some parts of the economy are soft. Like Home Depot reported horrible earnings. Well, it's like yeah, you know, you had a big spending boom, boom, uh, you know, during 2020, 2021, 2022. You know, people doing um, home projects, people, you know, you build a new back deck, uh, you know, things around the house, etc. Well, guess what you. You build that back deck, you're not going to build it again. Right, right. Totally. <laughs> so well, yeah. It's just like, you know, yeah, of course, in any in any bull market, in any strong economy, it's not like every every business is not going to be um, bullish, right? Exactly. Like these things. Like of course, of course, there's going to be soft spots. But in, in aggregate, and that's what we're often talking about, is in aggregate, things are, are going well. Exactly. Exactly. And I think everyone Absolutely. everyone kind of takes their eye off the ball. You know, they don't they don't see the forest for the trees. Right. 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 And people will be like, "Oh, you know, Home Depot. It's like a it's like a <laughs> bell." And it's just like there's so much. And I, you know, I want to get into this maybe maybe another time or something. But there's so much of just like people just taking you know boomers just taking you know some sort of historical correlation and posting it on Twitter and saying, "Well, this is." This is proof that we're about to enter a recession because <laughs> right. you know we've never had a, a period of you know where uh, you know Home Depot reported this, this, <laughs> by this much and, and, and we not and whatever whatever sort of cockamamie excuse uh, that, right. that, that, that they come up with or the yield curve stuff that's another thing I've been thinking about that or or it's the year before an election and historically <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh one, so one thing I actually wanted to touch on, um, is, so I know, uh, you know, some people that, that listen to our podcast might also follow Michael green on Twitter. He goes by prof plum 99. And I think he's pretty firmly an MMT and I think he, uh, he and Warren, uh, agree on most things. 
what they do, they do disagree on um, kind of the outlook for the economy. So Green is expecting a recession. Mosler is obviously bullish. If you li- if you've listened to our conversations with him or paid attention to what he's writing on Twitter, um, but Green is bearish because um, you know he agrees that the deficit spending is is uh, what's keeping the economy going, and the rate hikes are um, stimulating the economy. But he thinks that it's mostly accruing to savers and people that will not, um, at least in the case of the interest income, um, will not spend those those excess savings. So I thought that was interesting. I would really love to see, because this seems to be like a big point of uh, disagreement within the MMT community is like, where is that interest income going? And, and uh, who, like, are, are, the, are the recipients of that interest income spending it? You know, is it, is it having like the... Um, I don't know if you'd call it the multiplier effect, but is it basically trickling through the rest of the economy? Right, right. Well, I think a, a couple of things. Number one, uh, I, I, I've spoken with uh, Mike Green before. He's he's a super nice, really smart guy. We should try to get him on on, on the podcast. Um, yeah, but but uh, uh, I I'm not saying like like I, I I think that that is a valid point, and 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 we need to potentially explore this more, but. I would also add, though, that like what really what what I think Moser's real point is that what really matters is the aggregate sort of financial um, uh, and uh, situation of households and and and, and businesses in, right. in, in in the U.S. So if 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 you don't have if people have are if people are employed, they have income. They have income that can service debt. Okay, if if that if that debt service is manageable, you can, it, you know, the the economy should hum along. Right. Um. And and essentially, I think what the MMT view is sort of like every recession is about is a so called balance sheet recession. It's just the the private sector, the households and business and municipalities, um you know, don't have sufficient income for whatever reason um, to, uh, you know, pay back their, the, you know, the debts that they owe, whether that's, you know, a function of taxes or, or uh, uh, con- consumer debt um, or private debt, wh- whatever you want to call it. Um, and so that's sort of, it's, it's that situation that causes the pullback and in, in the aggregate pullback in, in spending and um, layoffs and stuff, and then you get the counterbalance, um, with the, you know, with the with the government's automatic stabilizers. Right. I also think um, that that there is something to be said for you know, like the the in, in, uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the you know the Chips Act and all these sort of um, manufacturing jobs that that. Are, and, the, and the capital spending that's happening right now that um, that's affiliated with that, and I think that's a big reason why uh, you know un- unemployment has remained low. I would add, though, that other measures of employment, including labor force participation and um, um, employment population ratio, while they have gotten better, there is still room to go there, and there's definitely cons- concerns. I think about there being enough workers in the economy right so we need to have um more more immigration and stuff because the boomers are just getting older and they're going to need um you know more bodies to to care for them as they as they age and stuff so um yeah we definitely there's definitely uh you know some there's definitely some some challenges and some problems but i think ultimately what matters most is uh, the, 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 the financial status of the private sector, the, the, right. the, the credit status. And, and, and up, up to now we're, we're not seeing, I mean, even looking at, you know, you know uh, j- junky corporate credits, like you know, they're actually still in, in decent shape in terms of uh, leverage, leverage levels and stuff. And the thing is when you have higher, like government, government spending is, 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 is a direct contribution to, to corporate profits. Yep. Right. It's part of like the Koleski profits equation. If the government spend, spending is high, then the profits are going to be high. And, and that means that there's, there's sufficient income to support uh, debt payments. And, and it's when that 
is uh, reverses when there's not enough income to support debt payments. That's when you run into problems and 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 recessions come. Yeah, so that's um, so. But the fact that you know earnings were up, um, you, you know, nine percent year on year for S and P five hundred companies. That's a that's a really strong sign that, that sure. things are okay, and you've got and, and, profit saying, "Hey, our earnings are going to be up this year." Right. And, and, you know, things like uh, mortgage delinquencies, I think, are at a near all time low. Um, so there's just like there's there, I, I'm not seeing the red flags. And right. like it, it, it still seems to me that the red flags are all in, um, you know, they're stuck in just like kind of conventional textbook monetary policy thinking of, oh, rate hikes are going to slow down the economy. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> um, which is wild. Absolutely. Um, uh, I have to I have to mention a uh, 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 one other thing from the Financial Times. Yeah, uh, go for it. Just just while just while we're doing it, uh, this was from the other day. So the, the the title of this article was Warburg, and this is a um, uh, 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 pri- private equity firm War- Warburg Pinkus. Um, Warburg boss says investors must focus on margins in era of high rates. Higher interest rates have. Uh, so fundamentally shifted the financial environment that inv- that investors must focus on a company's ability to maintain margins rather than just its growth prospects. Veteran private equity executive Chip K said, "Think about that. What th- what they're saying for a moment, okay? Higher interest rates are a real cost to businesses. When you have uh, you know floating rate debt, okay." It, uh, when when the policy rate goes up, your you know the cost of service your debt goes higher. If you want to maintain your margins, you have to raise prices. Right. It's not complicated, and and the fact that 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 is like a controversial view that where I'm like, oh yeah yeah, you know, rate rate hikes are inflationary because they they cause uh you know uh companies to to raise prices because their cost of funding is higher, so they have to. In order to maintain their margins, they, they have to raise prices, and and I get so much pushback from people for that. You know, you know what's odd to me about that is, like the the common um, kind of the common refrain on tax increases is that oh, if you if you increase corporate taxes, then those costs are just going to be passed along to consumers, right? So it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's just who's taxing you? Is it exactly. the government or is it the financial sector? Right. Exactly. <laughs> but but for some reason, there's so much resistance for recognizing that um, the cost of capital is just like a cost of doing business that will likely be passed on to consumers to maintain margins. Right. <laughs> crazy. It's, crazy. It, it's crazy. I also think that there's something to be said about the kind of and and Randy Ray uh, wrote about this in his book, like the balance of power between. Um, you know, lenders and bankers versus you know um, borrowers and 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 um, uh, you know uh, uh, borrowers essentially is that like when rates go up, that essentially means that comes at the expense of borrowers and to, and goes to the benefit of lenders and savers and bankers and stuff and fund managers. So so essentially, like it gives them the way I think about it is it sort of gives them a higher portion of total output. And so when you think about, you know, the distribution of output, the distribution of income in an economy, like zero rates don't necessarily like cause people to to start a business or to buy a house, but it is true that they are a benefit, you know, ex post to people who decide to, to do those things because, right because the cost the cost is lower right um, you know it's they don't it's have to raise prices on consumers if, if that happens too right I'm actually you know I'm, I'm thinking about how you know you and I have talked a lot about uh, or MMT in general has talked a lot about how you know lowering interest rates during a financial crisis um, is not going to increase bank lending because you're not affecting the number of credit worthy consumers out there. Right. Exactly. So it's the same. It's the same thing where it's like you will start a business if you believe there are, uh, you know, people out there with sufficient incomes or sufficient savings to afford your products and services. Right. Not because interest rates right. are low. Right. And that you can make a sufficient margin and sufficient return on investment. Right. That, <laughs> that you know, that I mean, this is. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable that that, you know, 
economists have turned you know sensible um you know thoughts like that and just and just like take that and and and, and say no that's not right and then give you some gobbledygook <laughs> uh in, in exchange um so uh should we uh, go over debt ceiling stuff real quick i would say i gotta run in a minute so let's uh let's go over the um the Madison quote that you found recently. Oh, okay. Well, okay. So I just I just stumbled this, and, and apologies because I, I someone on Twitter posted it, and I just uh, I I didn't uh, uh, record who that was that I found this posted. But um, so uh, apologies to that person. But um, basically, uh, you know, seventeen eighty ish, James Madison uh, wrote this paper called Money. And there are so many good nuggets, um, uh, you know, from from this paper that es- essentially confirms what MMT says. And so uh, here are a couple, uh, and you can find this online. Um, the uh, I, I, I got this on the what is this? The uh, um, it's from like the National Archives or something. So um, all right, here's one quote: If the circulating medium. Um, be a municipal one as paper currency, uh, uh, still its value does not depend on its quantity. It depends on the credit of the state issuing it and on the time of its redemption and is no otherwise affected by the quantity than as the quantity may be supposed to endanger or postpone the redemption. Um, So let's just, you know, think about that for, for, for a moment. Okay. Uh, You know, because they, you know, during wars and stuff, you'll see scenarios where, uh, you know, there's, there's high inflation or currency or currency depreciation, as, as they would call it. And essentially what he's saying is that the, the ultimate value, what gives the currency's value is that one day they will be redeemed. Right. right. So if you're pushing out that date, that redemption date, that's going to cause uh, uh, the currency to depreciate. And 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 so um, that that, you know, raise, raises raises you know, decreases your purchasing power with that currency because it's going to take longer for the government to be able to, or the issuing um, or the issuer uh, to be able to redeem it. Um, And if you think about, uh, you know, there's this book uh, uh, published last year called ways and means uh, that, that kind of went into, uh, you know, Lincoln's cabinet during the civil war and, and financing and Solomon Chase and and all this stuff. At the beginning of the book, they they show a chart that compares uh, the 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 price or the you know the relative value of greenbacks versus uh, the Confederate notes. And um, you know the the greenbacks, you know they they experience some inflation, but uh, but but it actually en- ends up kind of recovering. The Confederate re- notes basically go to zero. I mean, I think they experience like a seven thousand percent, like extreme hyperinflation. And they talk about this in the book how how you know there was no taxing authorities established by uh, the Confederacy, so essentially they just kept uh, issuing notes and and never redeemed them. But the, but if you think about it too, if if you don't have confidence that a government is going to be around, why would you? Why would you own their paper? Right. right? Totally. If you're like, okay, they're losing the war. This government's going to get disbanded. They're never going to redeem this from me. Then it's not worth anything. Right. Right. And, and so if you think that, you know, the United States government today is going to be around for, uh, you know, a, a very, 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 very long time and that it's going to continue to redeem its currency, well, then. That's that. That's enough, you know, uh, to for it to be a valid uh, currency and medium of exchange, yeah. and store of value and stuff. It's not complicated. But no. if you think the government's going away, they're never going to redeem it. Right. Redemption <laughs> date gets pushed out, you know, into perpetuity. So, right. I so I figured out who it was. I, I mean, I'm assuming this is where you found it. I think it was uh, David Andelfato, who used to work for the Fed, who tweeted <laughs> who tweeted a link to that. Oh, so right, right, right. So he, that is who I found. So he, yeah, he did like a write up of the original essay. Yeah. I'm like, I I just want to go to the source. Right, right. So he's, Uh so in, I'm I'm just looking at the tweet right now. In the tweet, he says, in his essay entitled Money, James Madison argued that inflation is not related to the quantity of money. My old professor, the brilliant and prolific Bruce D. Smith, mostly agrees. 
So it's basically it's re- refuting, you know, refuting the quantity theory of money, which has unfortunately become. Before it was even a, before it was even a real theory. Right. Before it was even, you know, Milton Friedman was even around. Right. 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 Which is amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, 150 years. Right. Yeah, 150 years before Mil- Mil- Milton Friedman was born. Yep. Um, you know, uh, and, and James Madison was already was already. Uh, uh, you know, debunking his ridiculous theory that still permeates today. That still uh, uh, it, it, it is used as as um, you know the, the foundation of you know, the 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 uh, political economy and and the economics profession in the United States and globally. That still has incredible influence on on public policy on you know. Uh, policies that, that that get passed and bills that get written into law. Literally, James Madison, one of the founders, talked about how it it was totally wrong. Right <laughs> at the founding of our country, it is amazing. It's just amazing. And it's amazing that something like this gets lost in translation. I, I'm just I read this and I was shocked. Yeah, like it's it's there. It's out there. How right. is this not? How was I not taught this in? My seventh grade civics class. Right. Right? Totally. It is amazing. So, but that's where we come in. That is where we come in. Knock on wood. <laughs> exactly. All right, Ryan. It was great talking to you as usual. Um, yeah, likewise, Adam. I'm going to jump off. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, we will all see you next time.